presentation of physical reality as a trans-empirical, trans-material wholeness which appears to us in two domains, actuality and potentiality. Now we have to ask, are the quantum properties of molecules important for biology? Biologists often argue that the molecules of biology are too large to be quantum systems. But chlorophyll, hemoglobin, they are large molecules and they are colored. That they are colored shows that they exist in quantum states. Their states restrict the quanta of light which they can absorb. If there were classical particles, not quantum molecules, they would be black. By jumping from one state to another, molecules can only exchange energy quanta. Energy quanta in terms of light means certain colors. In the 80s, the first quantum chemical calculations of the structures of dipeptides were performed in my research group. Peptides are the building blocks of proteins. The calculations yielded structural trends for proteins which cannot be obtained by classical computational methods. Such methods treat proteins as systems composed of classical particles. These systematic geometrical variations are experimentally confirmed quantum effects in the structures of proteins. The conclusion is large molecules too are quantum systems. We should treat them with respect. A triviality which I mention aside, an essential element of Darwinism is the claim nature does not make jumps. In reality it makes nothing but jumps quantum jumps. This is not an overwhelming piece of wisdom, but an example of how uncomfortable the classical perspective is. Nobody knows when it will lead to an error. For example, Richard Dawkins writes about mutations. The question of whether mutation is really random is not a trivial question. Mutations are caused by definite physical events. They don't just spontaneously happen. In this, Dawkins omits an important degree of freedom that molecules have. Namely, they can undergo spontaneous changes of state which have no discernible cause in the empirical world. From this we have to expect there must be spontaneous mutations. As it turns out, <coughs> such mutations do exist. Sorry for these technical terms, but depurinations, deaminations of genes, are examples. Here I show you a schematic presentation of a gene chain, an RNA chain. One of its sugars, this five-membered form, and one of its bases, a purine or guanine, never mind this garbage, but these molecules, the RNA chains, they exist in cells in the presence of many water molecules. A water molecule can interact with such a chain and sometimes push out this base and leave a mutated RNA chain. The quantum theory of chemical reactions describes such processes in terms of spontaneous transitions between quantum states. There is a state for the undissociated RNA molecule. When it interacts with water, it may form a transition state. From there, it may jump back to the original state or not. It may dissociate. The point is, the jumping from one state to another is not caused by anything. It is not predictable. The system has a certain freedom of choice. 
interacting with water, RNA may form a transition state, or maybe not. From the transition state, it may populate the dissociative state, or maybe not. Quantum indeterminacy rules. What a single actual gene will do cannot be predicted with certainty. The important aspect here is that in spontaneous mutations, the properties of virtual states come into play. The center of genetic change is shifted away from the empirical realm of the genes into the trans-empirical realm of virtual states. At that point, non-classical principles are potentially important. Nobody can state a priori that such factors are irrelevant. Terence Deacon is a well-known theoretician in the United States. He writes, biological evolution represents us with some of the most dramatic cases of spontaneous order from chaos. Similarly, he writes, creating something from nothing is an important part of what the universe is about. Jacques Monod, Nobel laureate has described similar views. A completely blind game, he writes, can lead to anything, even to the ability to see. Such views neglect the fact that molecules cannot make transitions from an occupied state into nothing. They can only exchange one state for another already existing virtual state. The example of the hydrogen atom can show what happens when a virtual state is actualized. In the ground state, the orbital looks like a sphere. When the system jumps to the 430 state, shaped like a donut comes to the fore. Are there donuts in Portugal? In this state, something like a bracelet or something like a, a gothic window in higher states. From this we can see, at the atomic and molecular levels, the emergence of new and complex forms is not from nothing, but from the actualization of a virtual order that already exists before it is an empirical order. We have to assume DNA is no exception from this rule. For genes too, the principle applies. Their future empirical possibilities are contained in their empty states, no matter how they will get there. This is the model of evolution as a process driven by virtual state actualization. 